Welcome to the Giving Voice to Depression podcast. We're your co-hosts, Bridget and Terry. Each week, we explore a different perspective on or experience of depression because it varies in form and severity, affecting us differently. Our guests share intimate details of their struggles, coping strategies, and recovery. We keep it real because the struggle is real. We keep it hopeful because there is hope in spite of what depression tells you. We're not experts or therapists. We're sisters and best friends who live with depression and know that talking about the illness reduces stigma and humanizes the experience, making it safer and easier to ask for needed support. You are far from alone. Today's podcast is sponsored with a Garrett Kelly Memorial Grant from the Charles E. Kubley Foundation in loving memory of Garrett and others who've struggled with depression. We are solely responsible for podcast content. Hello, Bridget. Hi, Terry. In the last two episodes, we looked at 10 reasons teens say that they don't talk to their parents about their suicidal thoughts. It's a good list, but not just for that specific situation, but as a reminder that we can all say and do things, often inadvertently, that shut down healthy communication versus encouraging open, honest interactions. Absolutely. And we realize that we only addressed half of the equation. If yeah. teens don't tell their parents, that means they're telling each other instead. And that's a hell of a heavy burden for another young person. Yeah, it's a hell of a heavy burden for any person, especially a young person. Yeah. Today, we wrap up our interview with Dr. Stacy Friedenthal, and we meet a school district psychologist in Wisconsin who oversees a mental health effort that is giving the students all the tools that they need to be able to say what they need to say and to be good listeners. Absolutely. All the tools we were not provided when we were growing exactly. up. Exactly. Exactly. There's a saying in the suicide prevention community that's both really harsh and really true. It's better mad than dead. Would you rather your friend be mad at you or would you rather that they go forward and, and die because they told you they were having suicidal thoughts and, and no adult knew who could help them? And I will tell you, I have met teenagers that that happened to and they feel tremendous guilt and they, they wish they could do it over again so that they could tell that person's parents or tell a teacher or tell their own parents who could then call the person's parents. That's Dr. Stacy Friedenthal, author of Helping the Suicidal Person. You know, this is what's so tricky. One of the many things that's so tricky about suicide is if you have a friend who's having suicidal thoughts and you tell their parents, and their parents get them help, and they don't die by suicide, which is great, of course. But then the, the friend who was suicidal might say, you know, I didn't mean it, or you overreacted, and you shouldn't have told anybody. I swore you to secrecy, and might be very mad. And, and there's no knowledge of what would have happened otherwise. Right, right. Do you see what I mean? I do. If, if that friend were to die by suicide, then it's like, it's tragically clear, oh my God, I should have done something different. Mm -hmm. But when things go well, which is great, I mean, I, I'm not saying I don't want things to go well, but when they go well, there's this kind of relativity of, well, maybe I shouldn't have told because it would have turned out okay anyway. But you don't know that. Yeah, no way to know. Ugh. And, and is, is the swearing to secrecy pretty much standard? It's very common that A, a teen tells their friend not to tell anybody, or B, that the person tells somebody and then the friend is furious and never talks to that person again. Mm -hmm. So if you're the friend, the classmate, the coworker, maybe even, um, you know, this could be middle school, this could be high school, this could be college, and you come to believe, either because you were told or just because you're seeing such changes, that your friend or this person is, is suicidal, what is the responsible thing for you to do? If somebody's in immediate danger and, you know, an adolescent tells an adolescent friend, tonight I'm going to kill myself and here's how I'm going to do it and, you know, I have what I need, then right away the friend should tell some tell an adult and possibly more than one. Mobilize and 
get as many people to circle this person with help and support as possible. If somebody says, every now and then I have the thought of killing myself, but I would never do it, then I think it's still useful to talk to an adult, but it's not urgent or an emergency. And the conversation might be more like, how do I help this friend? Or what else do I need to do? But an adolescent shouldn't be alone in that situation. They, they need support from somebody who is equipped to support them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, often other teens aren't in the best place to help them. Now, when I say an adolescent shouldn't be alone in that situation, I was talking about the adolescent who has a friend who's suicidal, but it applies to that person, too. Sure. You know, it applies to both. So moving from theory to practice, meet Dr. Jennifer Shavina. It's her job to see that more than 900 students don't have to be alone in that situation and that there's intervention before a crisis point is ever reached. My name is Jennifer Shavina. I am a school psychologist for Manesha Joint School District. And uh, at the beginning of this year, I took on an additional role as mental health coordinator for the district. For almost two decades, that Wisconsin school district has implemented preventative efforts to help with rising mental health concerns, including the Signs of Suicide, or SOS, screening program. First, the screener is sent home to every family in the uh, middle school and high school. So families are encouraged to go over the screener with their children before we even do the screener here. And the reason we do that is because we want parents to be very aware of what we're doing and to also... um, you know, maybe open up the conversation with their with their child so that they can, you know, learn more about how their child's doing in, in regard to p- potential depression. We're also trying to develop a mental health framework that addresses um, the younger grades as well. Support staff meets with each and every student who scores at risk or at high risk, and that's about 500 this year, to open up communication about their thoughts and feelings in regard to depression. Their parents are also contacted and informed of community resources. Then our goal is to follow up one more time in the spring with each of those students to figure out if that plan has been followed and if they need anything else from us. There are also lessons focusing on giving students the vocabulary, knowledge, and power to have these challenging and difficult conversations. One of the biggest benefits we've seen is that our kids will come report to us if they know of a peer who's who's talking about suicide or, or implying or anything that they feel is a red flag. It's it's amazing that how many you know reports they they are comfortable bringing to us. For example, I may have a student come down and say, "My friend posted on social media that she feels like it's not worth it anymore." They may come down because they've heard a comment made in class, and it could be a student they don't even know. We've had that before, hmm. but they're just concerned and want to, to let us know. Um, they, they might come down about their best friend, and they don't know how to talk directly to their best friend, but they know that they need to report the information to a trusted adult. That's a big responsibility for kids. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. They do it, though. That's amazing, and it's, I think it's a direct result of being taught how to do it and that it's okay to do it and that the adult you tell isn't going to say get back to class or whatever. Right, right. It's been, it's been normalized for them. You know, since sixth grade, they've been hearing the message that this is what we do, this is what you do, and it's simple. You can remain confidential, but do it because you care about other people and because it's important in saving lives and they do it. Part of the message these students have been hearing is that the warning signs they might see or hear vary. One of the good things is that they've learned that it's not always a a comment that uses the specific words related to death. It could be a comment, I'm done with this. But they, they just want to make sure that it's nothing more serious So even if it's not um, directly using the language, they still are concerned enough to bring it to our attention. And we follow up with those students and parents and and guardians. What's the family reaction? Do parents buy into this pretty much? Or are they, do you get the, you know, keep our business private, this is a family matter sort of pushback? What we've learned over the years is that we've really gotten parents involved from the beginning 
that letter and that screener prepares them for whatever phone call they may receive. So when we call, it's not a, oh, you're doing what? You know, they already know and are aware of what we're doing. Mm -hmm. And some have been aware that this has been going on since sixth grade. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, so it's most of the time our, the response is, thank you for calling. Thank you for taking the time to talk to my student. Can you check in with him or her again? Um, yes, I will. Um, I'm going to call a local agency right away. Most of the time, it's that response. Mm. To be clear, the school district's efforts go far beyond suicide prevention. Overall mental health, resilience, and other program goals will benefit these students for life. So our ultimate goal is that students will graduate high school and become um, good citizens. You know, that they'll be kind and caring of their of their peers, of their colleagues, that, that, that they'll be able to emotionally regulate themselves so that they can hold jobs, um, so that they can, you know, adapt to their environment, whatever challenges they may face in their future. We asked Jennifer why more school districts, why all school districts, aren't prioritizing mental health when both the need and the benefits are so obvious. As is often the case, budgets came up. She's proud of the fact the Menasha Joint School District's success has been achieved largely with existing resources. We do a lot of our mental health planning and initiatives internally. So we don't have to contract out with other agencies and pay thousands of dollars for someone to come in and do all our screening. And that has been huge for us because we have built that capacity within our pupil services team Mm -hmm. to be able to do a lot of these initiatives. I think, so I think budget constraints and not feeling like they have the capacity uh, or maybe not having the capacity is a, is a huge barrier for other districts. Convinced of their program's value and committed to the cause, Jennifer ended our talk with an offer. I'm proud to be a Blue Jay, and (laughs) if anyone ever wants to talk with us about what we're doing and how we're doing it, we're always willing to share that information because we want to spread the word and, you know, help each other as school districts. I get a lot of help from colleagues from other districts on how to continue this work. So collaboration is key. And we all need to share our conversations and ideas with each other to keep moving forward with this kind of work. We will link to the Joint District's page. And if you email us, either Bridget, B-R-I-D-G-E-T, or Terry, T-E-R-R-Y, at givingvoicetodepression.com, we will send you Dr. Shavina's direct email, too, which she authorized. Oh, so awesome. And, you know, I also think we should take a second to say sometimes the parent may not be the most resourced person to reach out to. Mm -hmm. So find another adult who is equipped to help. Right. School counselor, a relative, maybe a friend's parent who you're able to talk to, a teacher, a coach, somebody in your religious community. And there's always the hotline, the 800-273-8255 that might be able to give you some more ideas. Excellent. And next week, Terry, is our 100th episode. That's exciting. We will be speaking with a former NFL safety who chose to address mental health in his Hall of Fame induction speech. And we reached out to him and he is sharing his story and uh, advice with us and with our listeners. I look forward to it. Me too. And I just want to say thank you to everyone who listens and just knowing that you're out there and being with us. Being here with us is just heartwarming. It is. It is. It's really uh, been quite a journey, and uh, we didn't want to take it alone any more than uh, we want you to be taking the journey with depression alone. So it's uh, stronger together, right? It's nice to be going through this together. Absolutely. I love you, Terry. I love you, Bridgie. We truly hope that our podcast brings a little more understanding, helps you better articulate your experience of depression, or better understand how to support someone else's. We invite you to join us for daily posts on the Giving Voice to Depression Facebook page and on Twitter and Instagram at Voice Depression. It is a comfort to be among fellow travelers on depression's dark road. And remember, if you're struggling, speak up. If someone else is, listen up.